back to architect a branding blueprint that builds authority. I got it that time. You did. I did. Yeah. You did. Um, Nicely done. Thank you. It was yeah, a little little on the tongue. Um, I'm gonna kick it back over to Ryan so that we can get into this next section and uh, and then have lunch in a little bit. Great. Yeah, and I know the the previous session was long and it was heavy. Um, Everything gets a little more like light and fun and woo um, from here on out. I, but it's just so dang important. It's just so important. So I wanted to purposefully spend uh, extra time there, both so that you'd have some time to really think about it. We could dwell in it and kind of simmer in it and linger in it. But I also just wanted to express its importance by the amount of time that we gave it. Because most people, when it comes to branding, they don't think about the stuff uh, that we talked about in, in the very first uh, part. They also don't think about what we're going to be talking about next, which is how do we actually create authority? How do we amplify the authority of our brand in some very specific and tangible ways? How does that happen? How do we go about amplifying the authority and what are some of those authority amplifiers, some of those levers that we can pull to instantly create some authority even when we aren't truly there yet? So how do we model authority? Now, quick disclaimer, I'm going to be showing you a bit how the sausage is made. And um, what I did to come up, uh, to really dive into this, is I, I studied who are some of the most authoritative figures and brands of all times. So I looked at major world religions. I looked at cults. I looked at uh, thought leaders, types of people that everybody knows who they are, and they seem to come out of nowhere. And I tried to capture what are the unifying traits and characteristics that I see across all of these movements. Because really, when a brand takes hold, when a brand takes over, what it actually does is it starts a movement. So we looked at the movements. Now, I'm going to speak as we go through these. I'm going to use certain examples at times. Uh, and sometimes it can make me seem very insensitive about uh, the particular movement that I'm talking about. And maybe there's a movement that you ascribe to. And I speak about it in a way that makes it uh, seem invalid or that it's like merely an example. Please know I'm not trying to do that. All right, please know that I'm just trying to learn from everything. And I believe that marketing, branding, movements, they can be used for the forces of good or for the forces of evil, and we can learn from all of them. Oftentimes, we can learn more from the ones that, that did badly than we can from the ones that uh, did great things, tragically so. But if something bad's going to happen, you better believe I'm at least going to learn something from it. Because that's who we are. It's one of our values. You saw that before. So that's my disclaimer. Now, if you're in the room, um, you have this handout. This is the Instant Authority Framework. These are the five ways that we have found that authority manifests itself, the five tangible ways in which authorities begin to look more like authorities. So we're going to touch on each and every one of these, and um, I believe the download is also available if you're watching it uh, on the live stream, if you're watching the recording, the download should be available somewhere. It also is in digital format inside the branding blueprint that you should already have. So the point is you got this. So. And if you don't, just draw some freaking boxes. You'll, you'll, you'll be fine. So let's begin to reverse engineer authority. What is the anatomy of authority? So we think about all authority figures, movements. One of the first things that they have, all have in common is they all have a plan. They all have a plan for your life. They all have a plan for your life. So you currently sell a product. You sell a service. But do you have a plan for success? Do you have a plan for success? You saw a product or a service, but have you connected what your product or service does with a greater plan for someone's life? Now, let me tell you what I don't mean. I don't necessarily mean a book. So a lot of companies say, yep, we got a book. I wrote a book. So here's my book. You know what the problem is about books? No one has ever read a book. All right? You have people who pastor churches, professional theologians, that have never read the Bible, but they know what the Ten Commandments are. Okay? So when we think about a plan, I'm not thinking about a comprehensive book, a novel. All right? This needs to be distilled down to tablet form. This needs to be distilled down to an artifact, to something that can be explained simply, easily, passed along, shared with others. That is a good plan. These are stepping stones along the way. It is not a comprehensive user manual for your life. It is a general plan. That's what we are talking about. What is the plan? Reference Dave Ramsey before. Love him, hate him, can't deny that the man has created a movement. Second um, highest syndicated radio talk show in America. 
and he tells people to cut up their credit cards. You would not think that, that would be a popular idea and everybody wants to listen to him. Why? Because he has a plan. He calls them the seven baby steps. Step one, save $1,000. Step two, pay off your debt using the debt snowball. Step three, put three to six months savings in a fund. Step four, invest. I believe it's 15%. Uh, step five is to fund college if you have kids. Step six, pay off your house. And then step seven is to give. This is his plan. This is his, these are his seven baby steps. Again, we don't need to have a conversation about is this good or is this bad? It's irrelevant. The point is he has a plan. And if you're someone who wants financial independence and you see that this person's got a plan, you're going to follow them. I remember going backpacking one time. I only did it once because it sucked. We slept in this thing called a tent, also known as not a hotel. But I did it once. And um, the person who was leading it was called the guide. And the guide had two things that I didn't have. The first was a map, and the second was a compass. When you were lost, you followed the person with the map. All right? You want to be an authority, have a map. We've written some books at Digital Marketer. Again, I don't think anybody has actually read them. Many of you have bought them. I appreciate that. I like that we've literally written the book on digital marketing at Digital Marketing for Dummies. I believe that some people have read it. But these books have not had nearly the impact on people's lives that this silly little napkin did. How many of you have heard the story of the million dollar napkin who are in this room? Now, I can always tell how long you've been involved in this world by if you've heard the story of the million dollar napkin. Because funny enough, I don't tell the story of the million dollar napkin all that often anymore. The million dollar napkin has been replaced a bit. But the year was 2006. My business was not doing well. It was doing fine before, and now it was doing very, very, very poorly. I'd overcomplicated things. I'd made it too difficult, too challenging. Uh, in addition to having uh, a new wife and a new mortgage and a brand new baby boy, uh, I also had tremendous amounts of debt because I'm trying to figure out how the heck do I make this thing work. And I'm sitting at a bar at the Hilton Anatole in Dallas, Texas, just pondering, like, just like drinking by myself, which they have a word for that, um, and trying to decide, like, what should I do? Should I go crawling back, ask for my old job back? Should I make a go at seeing if I can get this business to work? And I just said, okay, if I, if things have just gotten too dang complicated. And the only way I can simplify this, uh, I remember having a conversation with a buddy of mine Year, year or two before, he said, doesn't it seem like, isn't it funny how all of these startups that come out now that are getting funded, that, you know, their ideas are just on a napkin? We had this conversation just offhand. We had it briefly, conversation was over, we both went on with our lives. That conversation I recalled right then and there in that moment. And we're thinking, that's it, a napkin. If I can describe my business model on a napkin, then it's worth pursuing. And if I can't, then it's too complicated, I have no business pursuing it. And so, sitting in a bar, I looked up, there was a stack of cocktail napkins, I grabbed one off the top, I borrowed a pen from the bartender, and I wrote this. I wrote the first marketing funnel. It was, let's have a self-liquidating offer, a entry point offer, a tripwire, so to speak. Have that go into a core offer for the people who buy that. Do a profit maximize of the people that don't, we'll put them in a return path. That became the million dollar napkin. And this idea of the five-step funnel, lead magnet, tripwire, core offer, profit maximize, a return path, while many people haven't heard of the napkin, they've heard of the five-step funnel. It became a thing. This was the first plan. Now, I announced a couple years ago at Traffic Conversion Summit that while the napkin is good, it was incomplete. So we added to the napkin, and that became the customer value journey. There's lots of people at Digital Marketer now who they never heard of customer value optimization, they've never heard of the five-step funnel, they've never heard of the napkin, but they've heard of this, they've seen this. This is the foundation, this is the plan. This is our plan at Digital Marketer for success. Eight-step customer value journey. Awareness, engagement, subscribe, convert, excite, ascend, advocate, promote. This is our plan. This is the plan for creating successful customers from scratch. This is the plan. You don't have to know every step to know that I've got a map. And if you're lost in the journey of creating customers from scratch, the mere fact that I have a map makes me an authority. I could have a map that is wrong, but that's the risk that you're probably going to be willing to take if you don't have a map. Heard the expression in the land of the the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Authorities are often one-eyed men. Now, I'm not saying that you should have a map that sucks. This map is incredibly good. We worked really, really hard on it. If somebody follows the map, they're going to get where they're going. What I'm simply saying is sometimes merely having a plan is enough. Don't overthink this.
You know it's working, by the way, when people are printing out your plan <laughs> and they're putting it on whiteboards and posting it on their walls. So what's your plan, right? What's the step-by-step -step plan for success that you have created for your clients and customers? Interestingly enough, it's important if you're going to have a plan for them that everybody agrees on where we're going. That's why vision matters. They first have to agree with what is going on now and where we're going for them to even be interested in hearing your plan. That's why if you don't have vision, it doesn't really matter. Our backpacking guide says we're going to summit that mountain over there. We're here, we're going to go there. Here's the map. Do you agree that you want to summit that one? I do today. Will I tomorrow, the next day, or the next day? No, I'll hate the fact that I went on it. But at that moment, did I agree? You better believe it. So I followed him because he had a map and I didn't. He'd been to the top of the mountain and I hadn't. What's your step-by-step -step plan for success? This takes your product, your service, away from merely product or service land and into the, la into the land, into the realm of real value, into use case. Never forget that nobody is buying your product or service because they want the thing itself. They want what the thing does for them. It's a vehicle. Two things that people buy. Transformation and identity reinforcement. Another way to look at it is transportation. Where's your product or service going to transport them to? What less desirable before state of the end that you're going to take them towards? Number two, specific answers. Authorities have specific answers to specific questions. Authorities have specific answers to specific questions. This is one of the first things that authorities forget when they become authorities. They float around 30,000 feet above the earth and they forget that those pesky human things they're serving live down on the ground. We did this. I still do this. My wife says I'm prone to monologue. You may have noticed. But we, a digital marketer for a very long time, stopped talking about specific tactical things. And we started talking in these broad generalities. We published a product years ago called 43 Split Tests. And one of the most you know, valuable things that people got from it is we, we get questions all the time. What color should my buy button be? What color should my order button be? Do you know what we said? Orange. You know what people did? They went, thank you. And then they moved on with their lives. Now, later on, we were troubled to find that, crap, orange is good, but sometimes green works. You know? Basically, as long as it kind of contrasts and is noticed, it kind of works. And then we got into color theory. We're like, you know what? Red says stop, so it probably shouldn't be red. So, and so when people said, what color should the buy button be? It was like, well, really, it depends. It kind of depends. It depends. Um, you know, you want to make sure that it contrasts, but then you also need to factor in color theory. I mean, very often, orange is good because orange is like red in that it's noticed, but it's not red in that it's a stop. But I'll tell you what else is good is green because green means go. You got to watch out with the shady green because sometimes it gets really muddy. It can almost get brown. It can also blend to the background. And green is a really tough shade on certain monitors and resolution. You get this lime green. It's almost angry, you know, and like pungent to the eyes. So it really, I guess what I'm saying is it depends and kind of, well, you just need to test it. You should just test it. People went, thanks? Which is code for thanks for nothing. Where are we going to go today? I don't know. I know we're generally going up there. Uh, there's a trail that goes over here, another one that goes over there. If we go through this, we might get a little bit wet. If we go through this, we're going to be out in the exposed sun. Hotter today than I thought it would be. Uh, there's a way that I've never gone before that might work. I heard from somebody else that it did work. What do you think? Man, I don't know. You're the freaking guide. I asked the question kind of like, hey, how's it going? I expected a fine. I didn't expect a conversation. Where are we going? Are you an authority or are you not? Right? Are you an authority or not? Which is it? Give some specific freaking answers. I love this post, um, just snarky headline that the New York Times ran back in 2013. A revolutionary marketing strategy. Answer customers' questions. Answer customers' questions and told the story of a uh, guy that owned an, uh, a vinyl pool company. And he was outselling all the other vinyl pool companies um, in, uh, in, in, in his area at that time because he put up this newfangled thing called a blog. And on his blog, all he did was answer questions. And he did it in the beginning because he was sick of answering the same question over and over and over again. So he just said, like, 
you know, why should I pick vinyl over this? And so he'd, he'd have the question as the title, and the body of the blog post was the answer. And he just did a bunch of these. And everybody's like, this is genius, thank you. And they'd, they'd, they'd go to his site, see the answer to the question, say, got it, makes sense, call him up and say, I want to buy one of your pools. He was so successful, so influential in his area, the New York Times ran a story about him. He then went on to become a pretty dang good marketer, launched an agency, I think he sold his agency. He now is uh, partners uh, with one of our certified partners, uh, one of our certified partner agencies, Impact Brands, they were our agency of the year. His name is Marcus Sheridan, and he and Bob Ruffalo run Impact, which is one of the top agencies in the country. His marketing secret, answer customers' questions specifically. Answer them specifically. I've referenced Dave Ramsey a lot, because he does these better than most. Dave Ramsey runs a radio show. What does Dave Ramsey do every single day? Answers questions. He answers the same questions again and again and again and again. You think he gets sick of it? I'm sure. I would. Does it matter? Nope. See, we make this mistake as authority figures. We get smarter and forget that the same people with the same problems are showing up every single day. And even the ones that we educate and influence, guess what? They graduate and leave us very often. But we want to follow them. Or we only want to talk to the people who are at our level. That's not your job. Those people are called peers. You want to be an authority? You need to help people who are where you were, not where you are. But we don't do that. We get smarter and we want to talk about the stuff that entertains us. I don't want to just say orange. I want you to understand all the nuance, like I do. And they're thinking, I don't care. Right? I have a site that sells organic tea. You know what I'm going to focus on? The best organic tea. I'm going to find it, I'm going to source it, I'll make sure it's packaged well so my customers love it. That's what I'm going to focus on. You're my marketing authority, just tell me what color the freaking add to cart button should be so I can get on with my life. That's what they're thinking. Got it? Be an authority. Jason Lemkin, he sold his company EchoSign uh, to Adobe for, I want to say, around $400 million, also known as he ain't got to worry about money no mo. And so he's retired and bored, so what does he do? He goes on Quora.com. He's a successful SaaS founder, had a successful exit. So what does he do on Quora, which if you haven't seen Quora, it's just a site where people ask questions and other people answer them. Okay? So he went on there and he just started answering people's questions. He's answered nearly 4,000, I believe, at this point. And then one day he said, you know what? I'm answering all these questions here. I'm going to start a, a blog called Saster. Saster, S-A-A-S-T-R.com. -S -S I'm going to start a blog called Saster and I'm just going to take, I'm going to write blog posts and all they're going to be is just the questions that people ask and my answer. I'm just going to literally copy and paste what I wrote on Quora on my own site. See, see what happens, right? Follow the same crazy harebrained marketing strategy that Marcus Sheridan did when he sold pools. Answer questions. And he answered a lot of stupid questions. A lot of stupid questions. Questions that are stupid to authorities, but very meaningful to our customers. Also known as not stupid. But out of this little blog and answering questions, right, the guy now has a large event. He has a VC fund. All kinds of things that came from just answering questions. If you need ideas, answer the public.com. Answer the public. Type in your particular category. And answer the public will tell you these are what people are searching. These are the questions they are asking. Now, ideally, if you know your market, if you're talking to your customers, you're hearing the questions they're asking. Ideally, right now, if you were just to sit there, you could come up with 10. But I also know that sometimes, uh, we forget sometimes it's hard, so this is a good way to queue up what some of those questions would be. I mentioned before Quora.com, Q-U-O-R-A, Quora.com. Type your category into Quora. What I like about Quora, and why it's even better than Answer the Public, is it doesn't just have questions, it also has the answers. All right? So you can look at them and be like, that's a real good answer. Aggregate all the different answers. Add your own spin to it. All right? Quora has questions and answers. So, what are 10 to 20 ultra-specific questions your customers are asking that you can answer? Every world religion you've ever known had ultra-specific questions, uh, ultra-specific answers to ultra-specific questions. How to dress, what to eat, what to do and when to do it. Because that's what authorities do. Parents, you got young kids, all you do all day long is answer questions again and again and again and again and again. And that's your job because you're an authority. 
When they stop asking you questions, by the way, well, that's when you're no longer their authority, at least in their mind. So, you wanna be an authority figure, we need to have a plan. We need to answer questions. We also need to maintain absolutes. This is so hard for me. I demonstrated it earlier. It is so hard for me. I like to be precise. I like to be right. I don't like for somebody to come out of nowhere and be like, you're wrong about this. I want to qualify everything because there are actually very few absolutes in this world. You can always find an outlier. You can always find an edge case. You can always find a time when that thing that you said to do didn't exactly work out. Like I said, and somebody can go, you're wrong about that. That will always happen. And so if you have an ego, like I do, like you probably do, this is going to be hard for you. If you're a critical thinker, it's going to be hard for you. If you're not a critical thinker, this is easy. You're like, yeah, I just say crap all the time. What I will tell you is that don't confuse accuracy with authority. Don't confuse accuracy with authority. Some of those accurate people on planet Earth are also some of the ones who are the least influential. Most of them are working in academia. Malcolm Gladwell is an academic who writes books, books like Outliers and some of the other books that have gone on to have quite wide appeal. He catches a lot of flack in the academic community because they basically say, you take our theories and these understandings and you, know, you want to popularize them and dumb them down for the common person so you can sell a lot of books, but you, know, you don't explain the way you explain this is that's not quite right. And I say more like this, and he's like, I don't care. I simply want to be understood. I want to influence. Had a conversation with uh, Robert Cialdini. We got him to speak at TNC a couple years ago. Been you know, fortunate enough to become friends with uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, if you've never heard of him, he wrote the book Influence, Psychology of Influence. He wrote Persuasion. He did the same thing. He's a professor. He's a professor who understood how influence worked and only ever taught it in classes, only ever discussed it at the academic levels. He wrote a book and was basically said, here's how influence works became a bestseller, influenced most of the marketing strategies that you've seen, whether or not the people influencing those, doing those, leveraging those, teaching them, realize it or not, he was the person behind it. Social proof, what I'm talking about right now, authority, he was the person who really popularized that. What did he do? He took the ideas and he made them easy to understand. He caught a lot of flack for it, caught a lot of heat from his peers in academia who said, you didn't tell everybody everything. You weren't as accurate as you could have been. Nobody sure was influential, still is is the expert, the authority on influence. Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest. We said, okay. I am the greatest. Dave Ramsey says, there is no such thing as good debt. All debt is bad debt, period. He says, if you can't pay cash, you can't afford it. I want to tell you what you're allowed to do what you're not. Why? Because I'm an authority. I'm going to speak in absolutes. Don't cross the street. You are not allowed to leave the yard. Now, when they get older, are they allowed to leave the yard? Yeah, maybe. But for right now, absolute is you cannot cross this line. Is it arbitrary? Yep. I get to do that. I'm an authority. Is it accurate? Are they capable of crossing it? Of course they are. If they cross it, will they necessarily get hit by a car? Probably not. Don't confuse accuracy with authority. I'd like to introduce you to the undisputed king of absolutes, the person who has mastered and taken absolutes to an absolute art form. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> there has never been a better time in the history of time than right now to start a business. Is that true? I don't know. <laughs> the best, right? The best marketing strategy ever. The best market strategy ever, care. What's the best ever? Is it really the best ever? I mean, I know caring is important, you should care, but like there's people who have some good market strategy and give a damn about the customer, I mean, so is it really? I know you should spend 0%, 0% of your energy on things that don't matter. I'm not even sure if that says anything at all, but it's very absolute, very direct. <laughs> All, none, always, now, never, period, guaranteed, I promise, going to happen, fact, evil, dumb, stupid, genius, best, greatest, worst, one thing, everything, nothing, everyone, no one. Learn to use those words. Those words are your friend. This is so hard for me to do. 
And it is the reason, it is the reason that I am not seen as the authority that I could be. I trade some authority for some accuracy. Knowingly, I do it. You will know when things aren't going so well for Ryan when you start seeing me speak in blatant, flagrant absolutes. It's like, that dude needs to pay some bills. Because I have such a hard time doing it. I admit it. This is one of those do as I say, not, as I, not necessarily as I do kind of thing. I'd be better. I'd be more impactful. I would. And a digital marketer, we encourage it. You know, we say, Let, let's be direct on this. Let's be specific. Because you know what? If somebody's got a problem, you know what they just want? They want hope. What color should my Bible be? Orange. Thank you. I don't have to work. Check. Give them a right answer. Give them a right answer. It doesn't be a complete answer. That'll come later. We don't do that with our kids. We don't do that with somebody when they're just learning. You know, any golfers in the room? Yeah, I mean, one. Okay, well, this analogy is going to be completely unhelpful. <laughs> But if you ever take golf lessons, there's the, there's the golf instructors that say, okay, take a couple swings. All right, now all I want you to think about is one thing. Think about getting it here and then bringing it through. Back and forward in kind of one consistent motion. And they'll work on your stance and your grip, and that's it. And they'll have you hit some balls. And they'll have you hit like 50 balls. And they'll go, okay, now we need to do is work on, you know, the, the wrist cock. The ones that suck and that are totally unhelpful go, okay, here's 20 things you've got to think about in this backswing. You're like, you just broke me. I can't think about all those. You know what's working when people are making quote boxes? Nobody makes quote boxes about namby-pamby things. Nobody makes quote boxes about, uh, nobody makes quote boxes when statements are heavily qualified. Right? Skills are cheap, passion is priceless. Right? Skills are cheap, passion is priceless. Except when your passion is directed in a slightly different way and you have really solid skills that are meaningful to the marketplace. That second one, nobody will ever make a quote box out of that. Careful with your qualifiers. Careful with your qualifiers. You also know it's working when you start getting haters. This is another reason why I have a hard time with this. I don't like not being liked. I'll admit it. I have a really hard time with this. I don't like not being liked. I don't like people saying that I'm wrong. It feels bad. I'm in a position right now in my life, in my career, that I can go, I don't like it, so I'm not going to do it, even though I know it's the best thing. You may not be in that position. Do as I say, not necessarily as I do. If I need to eat, food, if I get hungry, if stuff ain't working, you're going to watch me get real opinionated real fast. <laughs> I mentioned Grant Cardone before. Whatever you think about Grant, and there's a lot of things to be thought about him. If you don't know who Grant is, Grant's a real estate guy, and he's one of the most brash, obnoxious human beings I think I've ever seen. But you cannot deny his success or his influence. And by the way, I said that to his face, and he was like, you're right. Um, I, love the, I love what he has to say about haters, though. Criticism is easily avoided by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. Criticism is easily avoided by saying nothing doing nothing, and being nothing. If you are an authority, you are doing something and saying something. Guess what? You're going to get critics. You're going to get haters. It is a sign of success, not a sign of failure. So what absolutes are you willing to maintain even in the face of haters? What absolutes are you going to maintain in the face of haters? Go back to your sheet, by the way. There's a spot where you can write down certain absolutes. You can write them down. A digital marketer, it must be proven and it must be step by step. You got a theory? That's adorable. Come talk to me when you got proof. Okay? Must be proven, must be step by step. Core beliefs. Does this sound familiar? Sound familiar to anyone? We heard this concept of beliefs. Remember, what do you fundamentally believe to be true about the universe and your place in it? When we talked about vision. We were trying to distill down to one primary core belief. Remember? I believe this to be true about the universe. Now what I want you to think about is I want you to think about expansion. Expansion. Expanding the core belief into multiple beliefs. I did this. Um, this is my uh, picture of my journal. Uh, the date is October 22nd, 2015. We knew we had this core belief 
I knew I had this frustration about the best product should win, so I wrote that down. We believe the best product should win, not the best marketer. We believe you shouldn't teach something until, until we do it first. We believe the biggest marketing sin is being boring. We believe theory is for posers. We believe in sharing and even celebrating our failures. We believe it ain't bragging if it's true. Have you ever heard any of these before? Have you ever seen a video that Digital Marketer produced along these lines? I'm Ryan Dice, the CEO of Digital Marketer, and we want you to know exactly what the Digital Marketer team believes. We believe the best product should win, not the best marketer. We believe that we shouldn't teach something until we do it first. We believe the biggest marketing sin is being boring. We believe in sharing and even celebrating our failures. We believe it ain't bragging if it's true. We believe nothing happens until something is sold. We believe in making decisions and owning the results. We believe theory is for posers. We believe that you should have at least one good belly laugh every day. We believe in leveling the playing field so those who truly give a damn can win. Speaking of give a damn, we believe that's essential but can't be taught. We believe the duck-billed platypus is proof that God has a sense of humor. We believe you don't have to crush your competition to succeed. We believe it's okay to be proven wrong. We believe that girls are usually smarter than boys and harder working too. We believe it's okay to change your mind. We believe it's okay to cry when you're having a really shitty day. We believe the best ideas often come from the most unlikely places. We believe Google sometimes does evil. We believe that no one has all the answers. We believe in delivering step-by-step -step solutions, not data without interpretations. And speaking of data without interpretation, we believe that's for cowards. We believe that's unhelpful. We believe that's the primary source of all the world's logical lies. And speaking of logical lies, we believe they wind up in a special circle of hell, along with the people who popularize them. We believe in saying sorry when we screw up, like just now, for example. Sorry for that circle of hell thing. That was maybe a little harsh. We believe in passing knowledge down. We believe that if you have to rely on deception to sell, your business doesn't deserve to exist. We believe it's usually better to ask for forgiveness than permission. We believe in doing the hard work first. We believe Kanye should smile more, and so should you. We believe both success and failure are temporary conditions. We believe chucklehead is a word. We believe information is worthless absent execution. We believe half-assed is better than no-ass. We believe being an asshole should be a crime. We believe it's okay to call someone an asshole publicly when they're being an asshole. We believe in giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. We believe if you buy something from us and it isn't a fit, even if it's your fault, you should get your money back. We believe in always saying please and thank you, sir and ma'am. We believe in knowing what others don't and doing what others won't. We believe you should never, never stop learning. We believe small businesses can change the world. We believe we can help small businesses grow and succeed. Therefore, we believe we can change the world. We believe we can change the world. We believe. We believe. We believe. We believe we can change the world. At Digital Marketer, we love what we do. And we love our customers. We learn from you. We admire you. We're thankful for you. All right, so after watching that, you feel like you know who we are. Now, a point that I would make is the majority of the people in that video don't even work here anymore. The majority of the people in that video, only three people who are in that video, even work at the company anymore. Now, we should redo it. We should. We should redo it. For the sake of, of the people who do work here, they deserve to be highlighted. They deserve to be, to be put on stage. We absolutely should do it. Why haven't we done that? Because it's not about the people. It's about what the company believes. It's about who we are. Now through that, you heard some of our values. You heard some absolutes maintained. You saw a little bit about, about our character, our nature, the silliness, the goofiness, the impulsiveness. We're going to pick up on that a little bit later, right? It's there. You saw a bit of a conflict, right? Really? We're going to call somebody an asshole. We believe in giving people the benefit of the doubt, right? So if you think about your core belief, there's going to be a number of sub-beliefs. There's going to be a lot of other things that if you were to go and, and unpack that, that you could likely point to as other beliefs. I'm going to give you another example. Wrote this for uh, another company that we were launching in a very different space uh, in the survival and preparedness space. Now, this is like 
the chest thumping macho kind of consumer space. We believe you should always, always have something sharp on you at all times, even if it's just a bottle opener. We believe Han shot first, and so should you. We believe people should stop declaring it's 5 o'clock somewhere. You're an adult. If you want to drink a beer at 9 a.m., drink a damn beer and don't make a big production out of it, especially since we believe that coffee and beer are pretty much the same thing, molecularly speaking. We believe people shouldn't be so easily offended. We believe balls is a perfectly acceptable word to use when describing the condition of one's character, and therefore we believe that girls have bigger balls than most of the men we know. We believe if you found that previous line offensive, you either didn't read the lines before it, or you're the kind of person who chooses to get offended by things even when no offense was intended, and you probably don't belong here. Did we mention we believe people shouldn't be so easily offended? We believe stress won't kill you, but worry will. We believe you can always go nuclear, and that's precisely why it should never be your first option. We believe there's a massive difference between venting to a good friend over a good bourbon and complaining publicly to fake friends on Facebook. We believe the latter should be illegal. We believe skim milk should be illegal. We believe participa participation trophies should be illegal. We believe man bun should be illegal, but at the same time, we, should, we believe you should be able to do whatever the heck you want with your own hair, so never mind. We don't believe man bun should be illegal, but still, why? We believe less things should be a crime and that the world would be a better place if media and politicians spent less time deciding what was right for the people they don't even know. That being said, participation trophies should absolutely still be illegal. We believe half-assed is better than no-ass, but in the immortal words of Ron Swanson, we believe you should never half-ass two things at the expense of whole-assing one. We believe brunch is overrated, but breakfast for dinner should be added to the list of certain inalienable rights. We believe bacon, puppies, and the Grand Canyon are all proof that God loves us. We believe people's past shouldn't define them, but at the same time, we believe liars should be punched in the throat. We believe Washington lies. We believe Hollywood lies. We believe the media lies. We believe Wall Street lies. We believe skim milk lies. We believe Willie Nelson never lies. And therefore, we believe we would pay good money to see Willie Nelson throat punch any of the aforementioned liars. But at the same time, we believe violence should always be a last resort. We believe every person should have at least one hill they're prepared to die on. We believe the Boy Scouts had it right. We believe you should always, always be ready, willing, and able to protect yourself, the ones you love, and anyone else who is physically incapable of protecting themselves. At Survival Life, we believe we can help you always be ready, and therefore we believe we can make the world a safer place and a heck of a lot more fun. Now, you might have heard some things in there that you disagree with. You might have heard some things in there that you go, that's just wrong. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right. You're not talking to everyone. And I'll tell you, if the things that you believe don't turn a few people off, you're doing it wrong. You are doing it wrong. So I would begin cataloging a list of the things that you believe to be true. Southwest Airlines believes that flights should be cheap, period. Flights should be inexpensive. We are low price, low, that's it. So we're not gonna serve you food, you're gonna get peanuts. Unless somebody on the plane with a peanut allergy, then you're gonna get pretzels. And you know what, you're gonna like it, because we believe in cheap flights. And there was a, a woman who had been flying Southwest Airlines, uh, customer uh, for a number of years, sent a letter to the CEO, stating, you know, I, I just, I'm tired of this, I'm tired of, uh, you know, not having a seat, I'm tired of not having food, and, you know, I'm just, I, I can no longer be a customer of Southwest Airlines. The CEO of Southwest Airlines replied to this person with a letter that simply read, we'll miss you. Because they believe in something, and they're not willing to cave on that. So what do you believe in so strongly that you're willing to lose a customer over it? If you're not willing to lose a customer over it, I'm not saying that you're mean. I don't think that was mean. What do you say? We'll miss you. We're not going to change. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry that we're not a fit. We'll miss you. What are you willing to lose a customer over? What do you believe in so strongly? So we want to take that core idea. I'm going to go back and make you watch a Digital Marketers We Believe video, but the very first statement of belief was, we believe the best product should win, not the best marketer. And everything else from that point on was unpacking that broader belief and that broader idea and all the things that we believe to be true about the universe and our place in it, even the things that didn't make any sense. We'll come back to that later. Fifth, rights and rituals. Authorities have rights and rituals. Whether it's baptism, 
or circumcision or firewalking. Rites and rituals permeate cultures, societies, and religion. When you're 16, you go to the DMV and you get your driver's license. When you're 21, you go and drink way too much with your friends. These are rites and rituals, rites of passage. Some of them good, some of them maybe less good. But these are rites and rituals. These are how we mark our association with a particular group. This is how we say I'm in, part of the in-group. So what rites and rituals do you have? I'll give you some ideas. Option number one is to get them to do something they would ordinarily never do. Get them to do something they would ordinarily never do. Tony Robbins, that organization, gets people to walk on fire. Okay? That's not normal. Shouldn't walk on fire. Fire's hot. Fire burns. You shouldn't walk on it. Authority figures get us to do things we wouldn't ordinarily do. That's what makes them an authority. Dave Ramsey has the debt-free scream. Come on the radio and yell like an idiot, I'm debt-free! You do that, though, you're in the club. That's a rite of passage. So what are some things that you ask your group to do, or that you could ask them to do that they wouldn't ordinarily do? Option two, get them to alter an existing routine. In many respects, this is even more powerful. You're tapping into an existing routine. Dave Asprey and the Bulletproof folks got people to put butter in coffee. That's weird. Everybody was drinking coffee anyway. They said, you should blend up some butter and some MCT oil and all this stuff and not eat breakfast, um, and somehow that'll make you lose weight. And a lot of people said, okay, cool, I'm in. They altered their existing routine. So what existing routines could you get people to offer? One of the things that we do at Digital Marketer is we get people to use Facebook not just merely to interact with their friends, but to interact with the marketing community. So with our group, our community, people come onto Facebook because they're going to do their normal thing and they wind up growing their business. We're getting them to alter an existing routine. I'm going to go on Facebook just to screw off. We're going to make it profitable for them. We're going to make it enjoyable for them, beneficial for them. So it's the same routine. We're just going to alter it just slightly by having a community where people live. What routines do you ask your folks to alter? Um, and there's, there's a lot of ways that you can do this, a whole lot of ways that you can do this. I knew somebody who's in the supplement space. And uh, they said, OK, normally people get supplements. They sit on their countertop, and they don't take them because they forget about them. I want you to take our supplement. I want you to put it in the fridge next to like the milk or whatever in the morning so that whenever you open the fridge, you see it there. I want you to put it in this area. Get them to alter their routine just a little bit. Option three, get them to lick your brand. Lick your brand. Now, I don't mean this in a weird, twisted, perverted way. Get your heads out of the gutter, people. Think about when you're a kid, right? Or if you, like, had, if you were like the, the baby sibling, right? You had older, older siblings. And you know, you, you're a kid. You got a cupcake at lunch. Somebody really wants your cupcake. What do you do? Ah, <laughs> claimed it. Right? When we lick something, we claim it. That's mine. Blah. How do you get somebody to lick your brand? T-shirts are magical. Beachbody, health and fitness company, you could earn a t-shirt if you lost weight and sent a before and after video. You could earn a t-shirt. You couldn't buy that t-shirt, but you could earn that t-shirt. Stickers. Stickers are magical. Look at you. Can we get a shot on Justina's? Look at that. She's got stickers all over the place. She's got a Praxio sticker, got some other stickers. On the front, there's a digital marketer sticker. Yeah, it's all, all up in there. I would never do that. And it's my own company. I remember my mom, like, oh, you got a sticker? I want a sticker. And she put it on her laptop. I was like, oh, no. Like, I'm way too OCD for that. Like, I don't want to put this on there. But look at the room. He's got a sticker. You got the DM sticker on there? You know it's working when people are putting your brand on their stuff. And I've walked into a number of coffee shops, and I've seen those DM gears. And as an introvert, I instantly left. Um, I was terrified that I might have to have a conversation with a stranger. But... Stickers are magical. Stickermule.com, order some stickers. Somebody does something cool with your brand, they say something nice about you, send them some stickers, send them some swag. All right? Let them express. It's a ritual. It's a custom. Starbucks. You ever order from Starbucks? You know how they like never get your name right? They always write down something silly, goofy? It's a ritual. It's a custom. Something that they do. They teach. It's an aspect of the brand. That's 
just hardcore. <laughs> so what customs and rituals should you promote and institutionalize within your community of believers? We have another one at Digital Marketer. It's called the I'm New Here hashtag. Come in and announce that you're new. So write this down. If you do just one of these, that could sometimes be enough. In less competitive markets, really nailing down, really drilling down one of these five authority amplifiers, that is often enough. Do two and you'll dominate less competitive markets. Do three and category domination is near imminent. Do four and you'll start a movement. Five and you'll pretty much own the world. It's, it's really only your major world religions that manage to do all five in some way, shape, or form. And if you go in and you really unpack the people, the authorities that are in your life, you'll find that they do these. So my recommendation, pick three. Pick three. Three that come easily to you. Three that come easily to you. I said before, speaking in absolutes doesn't come easy to me. So I don't pick that one necessarily. We had totally abandoned the idea of answering specific questions. You know what? We went back. We drilled down on that one. There's videos of me where I'm answering specific questions. The same stupid questions I've been answering for 20 years. I'm sick of answering them. But you know what? If you're a musician, if you're an artist, if you're a band, you go on tour, you're going to play the same hit song every night, and the people are going to get pissed because you're not there for you. You're there for them. We live to serve them. So pick three. And then maybe have an outlier. You don't have to do all five. You don't have to do them all great. Once you pick three, I want you to go back to your brand blueprint I well, you ask, what is the step-by-step -step plan? A digital marketer, we have the customer value journey. We got that. We got a plan. We got a plan for your company's growth. Absolutes, I already said we're a bit weak on this. We need to do stronger. Core beliefs, you saw it. You saw our beliefs. You saw it. And if you were nodding your head, then, then you're one of us. Specific tactical Q&A, we had lost this one. We're reclaiming it, getting it back, doing a much better job these days, doing workshops like these that answer specific things. Blog posts that are way more specific. Rites and rituals. We got them, we need more. So where are we strong? Step-by-step -step plan, core beliefs, specific tactical Q&A. Need to improve in rites and rituals, that's next, and maybe one of these days we'll get back around to getting a little more absolute, a little more, a little more Vaynerchuk-y. Don't hold your breath, though. All right? Uh, when we come back from the next break, we're going to answer some questions, to do some of those questions um, to Justina. And with that said, I will turn it back over to you so that you can take us to break. Thank you.